Hey, this is Jussi. I run an investment firm that specializes in REIT investing. And recently I got to meet Ed Pitoniak, who's the CEO of Vici Properties at the City Global Property Conference. I asked him why should investors consider investing in his REIT today? I also asked him about their future growth prospects. And finally, we talked quite a bit about how their REIT compares to the average net lease REIT out there. Now, make sure to stick till the end of this video because towards the end, I'm gonna share also my opinion on the company and whether it's a good investment opportunity today but still before i get into it if you could please like this video it will help me a lot thank you very much and please let me know also in the comment section whether you would like to see more management interviews like this one hey this is you see i'm here with ed pitoniak with the ceo of vici properties the biggest casino net lease street in the world and we are here to talk about their assets their growth prospects as well as their their valuation and so Ed, the first question that I would have for you is how would you compare your casino netlist properties to the traditional netlist properties that most of your peers are targeting? Yeah, so when you think about what we own, and, and uh, for everybody's benefit, we own 10 assets in Las Vegas Strip and about 40 other casino assets elsewhere around the U.S. through the regional markets. Our assets, first of all, are very large in scale. For example, our Venetian asset is the largest hotel in America with 7,100 rooms. It's the largest private sector convention center in America at 2.5 million square feet, which would be a lot of meters, uh, square meters. And as a result, our real estate is truly differentiated. It is not commodity real estate. It's very large in size. It's magnificent in its construction, in the fit and finish of how it's, how it's uh, adorned. And Within it takes place a business that is in itself very complex. There's obviously gaming, but there's a lot of food and beverage. There can be entertainment, the light, for example, right now, Adele in residency at Cedars Palace, Las Vegas, which we own. So when you add all of this together, it is, again, highly differentiated. Most net lease real estate is not highly differentiated. It tends to be more commodity in nature. It's a smaller scale. It usually isn't constructed necessarily to a very high level of quality. Um, it tends to be in roadside locations as opposed to on big parcels of land. And the useful life in many cases is not all that. It might be a building that is good for 20 years. Our Caesar's Palace asset is at this point 55 years old, right? And it had its most profitable year ever last year. And it'll be here 55 years from now as still a very vital building. So you would argue that a property like the Caesars Palace as an at least investment would provide better risk-adjusted returns than, let's say, Dollar General in most cases. Exactly. You take, as an example, the Venetian, which we acquired and closed on just last year, we acquired that at 6.25% cap rate. If you take a Dollar General, I mean, you, you, you cover net lease rates very closely. The Dollar General, at least until very recently, when the cost of capital has increased, was often trading at a five percentage capital, right? Like, that does not make any sense. The Venetian, again, as I described, a magnificent colossal asset. The, you, you, you can't build these things every day. You can build what a Dollar General is in a very short period of time on any vacant land you can find, and they are they are almost infinitely replicable, which means you can often get into supply demand uh, imbalances that tend not to be constructed for the capital that's already been deployed. Right, and then on top of getting a somewhat higher cap rate and owning these better assets as you describe them, my understanding is that your lease is also quite a bit stronger with higher escalations than most of your peers and CPI adjustments. So, is that correct? That's right. Yeah. So if you take um, if you take our rent rate, about fifty percent of our rent roll right now has a, a CPI element to it. Uh, and an example of that would be our Caesar's lease, which escalated effectively November first, twenty twenty two, a few months ago, at eight percent because of what trailing inflation was here in the states. And so what that adds up to, even in normal times when there's no inflation, 
is same store NOI growth of 1.8%, which when you combine the benefits of leverage turns into about 2.6% growth in AF over share because of same store NOI. If you compare that to net lease on average, Green Street did a very interesting study about a year ago on what is what is the genuine same store net operating income growth rate of net lease rates. They actually came up with a number of 0.4%. So if you take 1.8%, even in the absence of inflation, compared to 0.4, we offer actually much more compelling same store NOI growth together with the highly differentiated real estate. Okay. And then switching topics back to acquisitions, your external growth prospects. We recently saw you do your first international casino investment in Canada, I believe. That's right. Have you, are you now putting a lot of effort into building an international pipeline? Do you expect uh, more deals to come in foreign markets in the near future? Yeah. So when we look at growing our business, we, we look at growing our business through two key dimensions. We look at growing it categorically. In other words, what new experiential categories can we invest in that we're not invested in today? And then how do we grow our business geographically? And so we've got a team of people that's working very busily to understand which geographies we can invest in creatively based on the REIT legislation that's there, the currency stability, and other factors that would determine how creative we can invest in those geographies. So we take the categories that we're prioritizing, we lay them over the geographies we know we can invest in productively, and those become our business development priorities. Okay, and then related to this, recently there were, well, an activist investor took a position in Six Flags. Mm -hmm. He's been pushing for Six Flags to monetize its uh, real estate assets, and there's been some rumors of uh, Vichy potentially also being a potential buyer for these assets. And I don't know if there's anything you could comment on these specific assets or if not on amusement parks in general. Yeah, I won't, I won't comment on, uh, on any particular theme park operator specifically, but I will tell you that for a while now, well before uh, this recent uh, activism, we've been intrigued with the theme park space because we believe it has a lot of the attributes that we really value. Again, lower than average sexuality, no secular threat. You're not going to put a... a uh, Amazon's not going to ship you a uh, roller coaster in a box, right? Healthy supply demand balance, um, barriers to entry are very high, and obviously a very durable experience. So the theme park space is one we think can support uh, an op go prop go model, as we call it, a sale lease back model. It's not that we'd necessarily tell the theme park operator, sell us all your real estate. We can buy selectively and, and give you capital to continue to invest in your business or find a more development assets. So we do think over time it's an area that we can invest in productively, both in the U.S. and then in the U.K. and Europe, where you have these very interesting businesses that are somewhat like theme parks, but, but a bit different. For example, you know, very intriguing businesses like Center Parks in the U.K. Yeah, and um, the final question here, uh, why do you think that investors consider this stock today? Well, let's let's start with our track record to date. It's about, been about five years from, since our IPO. Since our IPO, the S&P and NASDAQ have each returned between 48 and 49% for both of them. Not bad, but not great. We returned 110% since our IPO. So we have a proven track record of creating value. But then let's take 2023, we announced our guidance here a week or two ago with our earnings. The midpoint of our guidance calls for 10% growth in adjusted funds from operations or, or distributable cash flow. Compare that to uh, the, the consensus earnings per share growth for either the big REITs, which is generally between 3 and 5%, or about half to a third of what we're indicating, or the S&P 500 overall, which is maybe 2% uh, and maybe lower. So combining the earnings growth of 10% with our current dividend yield, which is about 4.5%, if you add those two numbers together, it's a decent proxy, not fail-proof, uh, fail-safe, or foolproof, I should say, but a decent proxy for what kind of total return you might be able to expect. So 14.5%. Now take the earnings growth, the S&P 500, 2%, the current S&P dividend yield of 1.5, that's up to 3.5%. So which would you rather have, 14 and a half or three and a half? And then of course, when you get to 2024, the question is, can BG continue to grow? And I think based on our track record today, you're pretty resourceful at, at finding and executing growth. 
uh, what it's there for. Well, one, one final follow-up question now related to this. Uh, one pushback item that I, I get occasionally from investors is that Vichy should trade at a discount relative to peers like Realty Income because it owns casino of real estate. And there is this perception that perhaps going to be more cyclical if we go into a recession, but as you, you've proven through the pandemic, this isn't necessarily the case. Is there anything you can share on this topic? Yeah, so let's let's take, for example, the great financial crisis, right? 08, 09, 2010. Regional gaming in America, and that's 40 of our 50 assets are regional gaming assets. Regional gaming from peak to trough, revenues went down on a same store basis 3.9%. Conventional retail and food service went down 11% peak to trough. S&P 500 revenues overall went down 18% peak to trough. So gaming is actually less cyclical than consumer discretionary at large, by a large margin. And when you combine that now with the shape that Vegas is in, which is really strong, I think investors can have an awful lot of confidence that our tenants will weather recessionary periods better than many of the tenants you find in conventional net lease. And that's just on a cyclical basis. The other thing I think investors in net lease need to think about is what are the secular trends behind certain categories, conventional categories in net lease? Like, if we continue to see the electrification of the American car fleet, what does it mean for convenience stores that are gas center, right? Mm -hmm. If Amazon decides it really wants to own the American um, pharmaceutical distribution business, what does it mean for conventional drugs? So I think as you look across the net lease landscape, there's an awful lot of attributes to our real estate that you would say on a both cyclical and secular basis, have a lot of advantages over the conventional commodity that was produced. It's very helpful. Uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Yossi. Always good to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. So when do I think about Vichy properties? Well, I own a position in the company and so obviously I'm bullish. I think that's arguably the best net lease street that you could buy today and there are three simple reasons for this. They own the best assets and have superior leases. We discussed this in the interview already. You can go back a bit if this wasn't clear to you, but in short, their properties are truly mission critical unlike most other net lease properties and they have stronger leases with larger rent escalations, longer leases, terms that true triple net which means that all the expenses are carried by the tenant and not the landlord and they have better security through master leases and other things. Then the second reason is that Vichy has better growth prospects than most of its peers. If you look at the past they've typically grown quite a bit faster than their peers like Realty Income and even in 2023 they expect to grow by roughly 10% day FFO per share. That's a lot faster than most of their peers. And then finally the third reason why I prefer Vichy over their peers is that despite having these better assets, these better leases and having better growth prospects, they actually priced at a slightly lower valuation than the average of the net lease sector. Today they are priced at 15 times FFO, some of its peers like Realty Income trade at closer to 16 times, so you're not paying a premium to get these better assets, better leases and faster growth prospects. Now if you want to learn more about this topic please note that I've posted a video comparing Realty Income and Vichy properties on this channel. I'll put a link somewhere on the screen so you can go watch that next. But to recap I'm bullish on Vichy properties. I would buy more of it at today's share price. I think it's very reasonably valued. It has strong growth prospects and it pays a near 5% dividend yield while you wait. Now if you want to learn more about what else I'm buying feel free to join my REIT newsletter for a two-week free trial. I'll put a link in the description and then if you could still like this video subscribe to the channel that will help me a lot thank you very much see you at my next one bye bye